Welcome to Coming Home Well. I'm your guest host, Liz Booker, a retired Coast Guard helicopter pilot and writer on a mission to influence the demographics of aviation through story. As literary aviatrix, I have built a community of readers and writers around books featuring women in aviation and have interviewed authors about their books and their writing and publishing journeys. A large portion of these stories reflect the ways in which aviation history is indelibly linked to military history. This interview is a rebroadcast of the Aviatrix Book Review podcast in collaboration with Coming Home Well. While my interviews span the diversity of aviation experiences, I hope the ones that are featured here will educate and inspire those who listen. These are human stories of grit and courage, failure and success, that happen to be about women in military aviation from around the world throughout our history. Hello and welcome to the Aviatrix Book Review. I'm Liz Booker. Learning to fly is challenging in any environment, but my guest today pursued her dream of flight under extraordinary circumstances. She was the first woman to earn her wings as a fixed-wing pilot for the Afghan Air Force. Throughout her training, she was persecuted and shunned by her peers, vehemently criticized by the citizens she served, and her life and the lives of her family were in constant danger because of her choice to serve her country. Despite the overwhelming odds and influences against her, she not only completed her training in 2013, but graduated at the top of her class. She went on to qualify as a C-130 pilot before seeking political asylum in the United States in 2017. Open Skies, My Life as Afghanistan's First Female Pilot is the Aviatrix Book Club discussion book, and it tells a story of unimaginable courage and fortitude. Reading it gave me an entirely new perspective on the experience of being a woman in aviation and on the privileges, what we would call basic human rights that we enjoy in the United States. The privileges of safety, security, and opportunity to pursue our dreams. She is joined by her co-author, a U.S. Marine Corps veteran and intelligence officer who has lived and worked across the Middle East, Central Asia, Europe, and East Africa. Niloufar Rahmani and Adam Sykes, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, I've been looking forward to this conversation. And Adam, you and I are going to talk a lot more in depth when we get into the writing discussion. But I just wanted to take a second to talk about it from a craft perspective, because I felt like, you know, there are a lot of ways that you can do a memoir or an autobiography. And in this one, I felt like you gave us exactly the information that we needed to understand this story and for it to tie together to really give us a full picture of of Nilofar's experience. And I don't know who gets credit for that, if that was a team effort or if that was your, you know, writing structure that went into it. And I look forward to finding that out as we talk. I also found that there, you know, there were places that you completely appropriately jumped in time. And then there were the places that you really slowed the pace down so that we got the full impact of some key experiences I thought that was all really masterfully done and I really enjoyed it. It's one of the most cleanly edited books that I have read. So good job to you and your editing team for that as well. So it's a, it's a really well done book and a very impactful story. And I'm excited to talk to you both about it. And so far, I would love to start with you and just, I'd love to understand what you were hoping to accomplish first of all in publishing your story. Well, I would like to thank you and Adam for sure. Let me start with just saying if it wasn't because of Adam, I don't think it would have done that greatly. So he's absolutely a knowledgeable, you know, about the culture, Afghanistan, and it absolutely made my life easier. Like, you know, I wouldn't wish for anyone else to help me writing my book, which was very important for me and my family. And the reason behind writing the story of my life is that, you know, I have realized there's two important things in life, the day that we are born and the day that we realize why we are born. 
And I guess when I came to United States and I have seen so young generation in the US and my friends and, you know, sometimes life gets so comfortable and we forget how, you know, lucky we are to be born in a country that there's less struggles. There is no shame to be a woman. And most importantly, it's a country with the freedom of speech, freedom of, you know, anything you want to do and accomplish your dream. And for me writing that, I wanted to give an idea for the younger or older, that if they dream for something and if they have a passion for something, they should not look down to themselves because ourself, we have to believe in ourselves first. And then everything is possible in life, no matter how difficult and how easy something is. Even if you think there's a dream that it's completely impossible, it's always possible to get it, even if there are so many barriers. And I hope this book and this story will encourage so many of so many of the young generation to go after what they believe and what they want to be in life and believe in themselves, most importantly. Well, I certainly got that from the story of myself and reading it. And I said in my introduction how this really gave me a new perspective on, on what, a ch what challenges you faced compared to those that I faced. I, I kind of took for granted that I could be a woman in aviation as a child and even in my early years in the military. And when I encountered people who didn't agree with that idea, I was shocked and, and that's the perspective I was coming from. And, but those were so few and so less threatening and less impactful than the experiences that you had and your fortitude in being able to survive those and continue your training and succeed is very inspirational. So I think that you've succeeded if that was your goal with the book. And I'm not the only one who, who feels that way. The other people I've talked to who have read the book also many military members too, who, you know, we've all been through some kind of struggle, but seeing it through your eyes is just a completely new view. How, Adam, how did you meet Nila Far and, and why did you co-author this book with her? So that's a, that's an interesting question. So we met by our joint agent. So I had been working with Judy Kapage and Samuel Duran for about a year or two before on fiction in a novel, writing a, writing a thriller. And Nilfar came to their attention and I essentially got a phone call one day from Judy and said, hey, we have this story that we think you would be very good at, at uh, perhaps writing. So they sent me some of the materials and I looked them over and I was just blown away. Extremely compelling and inspiring story. I'd spent a lot of time in Afghanistan and Iraq and the war zones around the world. And so hearing just the, the summary of her life it, to me, it was a story that had to be told. And I think our first meeting was a, was a phone call. And uh, we talked over the phone, and that's kind of where we went from there. And how about you, Nila Far? You want to tell your side of that story? Absolutely. So for me, as I mentioned, I got very lucky to find Adam, for sure. And uh, because it's so hard that, you know, you have a co-author that tries from completely a different culture, a different country, and someone that do not know about the culture and especially about the life of a woman in the country like Afghanistan. And I actually been really, you know, looking for a person exactly like Adam. And I have been blessed that I found him through Jodi Kopaj. She's great. And first I was working with another author and unfortunately we didn't like the job. And, and then she told me this time you will be really happy. I have someone else for you. And then Adam came. So, and then we start working together and it's definitely been a very easy process for both of us. Actually, we've been actually just doing everything over the phone. So we just, as Adam mentioned, we just met once in person, but it's definitely been a very good and easy process for both of us. And definitely easy for me, even with English and everything else was very easy for me to explain for him you know, sometimes what you think when you've been true, it's very hard to put it in a word sometimes to describe it for someone else. But I never had this issue with Adam. So it was wonderful to work with him. And as soon as I would just explain something, he would definitely nicely put it in a word and describe it 
nicely as exactly how I would feel and I have been true. That is wonderful. Well, congratulations to both of you on having such a, a good match and good chemistry between you that you could work together on this because it's you really succeeded, I think, in conveying. I, I heard Nilafar's voice in this story. So Adam, obviously that's that's a huge accomplishment for you as a writer. Nilafar, you know, I talked about how great the structure is of this book. And you spend the first half of the book basically setting the context for your childhood, the sort of geopolitical situation you were living in. Nilafar, can you talk about that part of your life, living as a refugee as a child, and and how that how you got interested in aviation to start with? Well, as I mentioned in the book, some people go in their airplane when they're a child, they fly and they absolutely fall in love with it. And they're just make a decision to be a pilot. And for me, you know, the first time I have sat in the airplane cockpit or even just say as a passenger was when I was very young, very, I mean, older. And it all comes, you know, as I mentioned, the dream of my father, especially when being a woman in Afghanistan, nobody counts on you. Like people think you are less than an animal. And especially the families that they have a child, a girl, they are not happy. The mother is embarrassed actually because the other people make her feel embarrassed and they shamed her. And woman is just a symbol of shame for most of the family in Afghanistan. And I was blessed to have a family that they always supported me and especially a father that never looked at me just as a girl and just tell me that I cannot do anything and I, they, he should treat me like every other fathers in Afghanistan. And, you know, I always wanted to be, I'm, I hate to say I wanted to be a son for him because I am proud for who I am and I'm a strong woman, but I wanted him to feel that even if he has a daughter, not only one, like four daughter, it's still they're strong enough and make their his dream come true. And growing up with his stories and the difficult life we had and how important it was for him, you know, it's still talking about it for him that he wanted to be a pilot, how amazed he was by jets and airplanes, and he never could make his dream come true. I always wanted to make that happen for him. And of course, there's, as I mentioned, there's not only one reason behind of what I wanted to do or why I wanted to be a pilot. It's because in Afghanistan, women are not even allowed to be educated, go to school. They take that right away from them. And I wanted to be a voice for them. I wanted them to see not only a woman can be doctors, teachers, nurses, they can be in the military. They can wear a uniform. They can fight against the enemy of their countries along with the men. And more importantly, they can fly an airplane because most people think it's genius. I don't think it's genius. Just go to school and work hard for it, have a passion, you can do it as well. Nothing difficult. You just have to love it for doing it. And I wanted them to be encouraged, to have a voice, to have an example for their own parents to say, if I see that woman do it, why I cannot do it. So slowly they would find a passion and think things are possible in this country, even if I am a woman. And because as I mentioned, so many difficulties in life that we have faced. And it was not easy for me to be like other women and listen that what the society want me to do. Maybe most people think I went against the culture, against the religion, against what people wanted from me, but I would never regret it because I feel like if I have changed one person, that means everything to me because one that one person can change another person. And it's not going to happen overnight, but it's definitely, it's changeable. Yeah, you you talk about in the book, just talked about being able to serve your country and showing people that you can do this. And you were in the circle of women in aviation, we often call ourselves unintentional pioneers. You know, we have a love of aviation, we wanted to do something we weren't doing it necessarily, at least most of the women that I know weren't doing it necessarily to be the first of anything that just happened. And I, I don't know if that's the case for you. You talk about in the book where you see the solicitation inviting women to, to join the military 
How did you react to that? And, and this is a spoiler alert for anybody who hasn't read the book yet, but I'd love to hear, you know, how your expectations going into the military, knowing your own culture, knowing that you were going to be one of the first to do it, how those expectations and anticipation for how you would be received matched or, or were disproportionate to what you actually experienced? Well, we all have to start from somewhere, you know, like nobody gives something to you and tell you this time, this day, this position is for you. So you have to start. And for me, starting this, not because, oh, I have to do be the first one. It's a race game. I have to do it. No, it's just happened. And I got, you know, I was as I mentioned that in 20 years, Afghanistan changed a lot for the woman and slowly girls start going to school and nobody ever thought there will be a chance for a woman to be part of the military wear a uniform. And that happened. And when I saw that this chance is available for me, I just did not want to lose that chance. And I went for it. And I wish there was other 10,000 other women more than that had this opportunity that joined me at the same time. And, you know, Afghanistan, if most people don't know about the story of it, Afghanistan and before the Taliban, it used to be completely a different country. And we did have two helicopter female pilots. And over years after the Taliban came and everything changed and those women everything been taken away from them. Nobody let them to even fly in the cockpit. They got older over time. They haven't flew forever. And I cannot imagine how painful it was for them to not be able to fly. And when I started it, I wanted to always, you know, as I mentioned, I'm so amazed with speed and I always wanted to fly something faster and always amazed me but unfortunately because Afghanistan never had like fighters and faster airplanes I chosen to fly a heavier airplane and that was something that I wanted to be you know prove for the society that we can do this if the men and the culture allow a woman to do it we all can do it nobody is better than anyone else They just need to have the chance and opportunity. And for me to join, of course, it never been easy because I know even in the United States, if a woman in the past started some journey, it never been without any difficulties or problems. They have faced lots of issues, of course. And especially when you come from Afghanistan, that everybody tells you no, everybody waits for you to fail. And everyone tells you you have to quit because you're a woman and you're going to crash an airplane and kill everyone. It's all about because they don't believe in you and they don't want you to quit and leave. And this is no place for a woman. But as I mentioned, if I never saw those difficulties or those words that I haven't heard, I would not be strong. Maybe I would just quit along the way. But Those words and those difficulties and being alone in that environment, in the class, in a class that there wasn't any woman and all the other men classmates tells me how every day I'm going to fail. That made me stronger, actually. And I think I came along and I'm proud of it that I haven't listened to it, but I think There has been lots of women that they came in the Air Force or any other army or any other part of the military. And they have seen what I have seen. They knew if they work hard, they're going to accomplish exactly what, why they are here. And they're going to fight for it. And I have been very happy to see that. You talk about being strong and being rewarded for hard work. I feel like the only reason that that happened for you in that context, though, was because of the international community that was in place there, that if the Afghan Air Force had opened up to women without them there, if that would even be possible, that you wouldn't have succeeded. Do you feel that way? Absolutely. I always say that we have been blessed, the generation that we grew up during this 20 years that, you know, NATO forces, Americans, they've been in Afghanistan because they wanted to bring a Western, I can't say culture, like 
Western life or freedoms that what a woman or a human rights, let's just put it in a word that it's every human rights to have these freedoms to choose for themselves, even if a woman, men, and whatever they want to do, because the life is given for us once. And if we lose this, there's, we never know, there's no guarantee we're going to come back to this earth and there's another opportunity for me that I have to do it. So I have been blessed that I grew up during this 20 years that I have seen what freedom is, what freedom of speech is, what a woman right is. And if the woman is given opportunity, woman can be, you know, good and they can be better in so many other ways if we think. And that's how I saw it. And if it wasn't because of the support or the NATO forces and American and Afghanistan, of course, even though if I had the support of my family, 100 persons, but if the chance is not given to me and they wouldn't there wouldn't be any way that I have to enter to start. It wouldn't be possible. And, and I'm very thankful for that. Not only me, other, so many other women in Afghanistan is thankful for that because we see that right now. As soon as they all left Afghanistan, we see where Afghanistan is going right now. The schools shut down again for, for girls in Afghanistan. No woman is allowed to go back to school. And how painful that is for even me being an Afghan woman, and I can feel what they go through. I know how hard it is for them to lose everything that they achieved and worked hard for it during these 20 years. It's going to break each one of them. And it's very upsetting to see what's just happening to their life again. You know, yesterday I interviewed Shasta Ways, who I'm sure you're familiar with. She currently holds the record as the youngest woman to fly solo around the world. There's somebody working on breaking that right now. And as you know, her family moved to the U.S. as refugees. And so she expressed how she kind of carries as a responsibility, having had the opportunity to grow up in the United States, to fulfill, you know, and achieve and take advantage of the opportunities that have been presented to her on behalf of all of the women who didn't have those opportunities in Afghanistan. It was a really good conversation. And we talked about you as well in this, in this whole context of what's going on in Afghanistan. So it's really a privilege to be able to talk to both of you like this, especially in the context. I mean, I couldn't have predicted that this was going to be, you know, the environment that we were in at this time. So I'm grateful for it. Going back to the flying earlier, you said most many people get inspired to fly because they go, they get in a plane when they're very young and, you know, you were kind of living through your father's dreams. So the first time you sat in an aircraft was in training. Is that correct? No, actually, the first time I sat as a passenger was when I had to move from Kabul to the base that it was our actually main pilot training base that we had to go to. And that was, I was actually a passenger on the two way, the airplane that it was the airplane that in the future I am supposed to fly. And yeah, that was, that was absolutely amazing view. And I wouldn't change it for anything else. But the most exciting was when I was in control of the airplane. So that was absolutely another wonderful moment to see. And I would never forget that. Did it live up to your expectations and your hopes for what flying was like? It definitely did. It definitely did. But I'm still not going to give up. And I always wish for to be a fighter pilot and fly a faster airplane and jet. And I think I'm going to still go for it and I still try. But I would never regret whatever I had in the past as well. I have learned a lot. I have. It all was an amazing opportunity and a chance and memories for me each, each moment. Yeah, I loved in the story when you were talking specifically about the training and the the struggles that you were having with landing, and it just took one good instructor pilot to identify the issues that you were having. And, you know, you're talking to an audience of pilots here, so we can all point to some moment in our journey learning to fly where we were stuck on something and, and an instructor came in and gave us the magic that made us succeed. Talk about what did it for you. 
that's actually make a, a very, very good, like very positive change on each student. You know, like it's so important. Like now I can tell as an flight instructor, like it's so important that the way that you teach and the way you understand the student, their struggles and the same thing early in pilot training, as much as I love to be in the sky every moment of it and every moment of flying is enjoyable for me I just was so disappointed I was like what is wrong with me why I cannot land the airplane and it's so important like when you're a student you don't know like especially when it's your first you know couple of flights and stuff you have no idea what you're looking at and what you're supposed to look at how high you have to be setting and all this And as you mentioned, and it just takes one good instructor to just find that struggle and tells you. And that's when I found out that, okay, I am sure if you flew the 182s, you can tell, like, even if you're tall, because the prop is like up front and the engine is up front, the airplane and the seats are so low and you can't even put it up in the one we had. And I barely could see like almost the nose of the airplane, even as much as I would put the seat up. And it was hard for me, like during the flare, I couldn't even see the end of the runway or anything. And I was just afraid I'm going to, you know, hit the nose or something. And by the time that I found out, like, it's my height problem, I have to fix this. And it was so enjoyable for me that I was like, wow, I finally got it. And that was the main problem. And it definitely fixed it everything. It was a seat cushion. That's all you needed. Yes, that was all I needed. <laughs> you just needed a seat cushion. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> I needed a couple. <laughs> well, you know, you get through this, this initial training and you get to solo, which is a fabulous, joyous event. It's a rite of passage as a pilot. And you got there and your Western friends wanted to celebrate it in the Western way by wetting you down and and I was so happy for you when that happened in the book. And the first thing I thought when I read that is, where are the pictures of this? Because it's a joyous moment. And then when I flipped to the next page and found out what the impact of that was for you and your family, like I'm getting emotional about it right now. Can you talk about that experience? Well, that is... You know, it's very unfortunate. And for what I had to experience, you know, sometimes you think it's the best moment of your life, but it turned out to completely a dark moment. And for me, it didn't last too long to celebrate that day, even though with my family or to have, as you mentioned, not having that photo, because first solo as for every pilot, they know what I'm talking. It's very important. Like that memory will last with you forever. And for me, that memory always lasts with me, like, I guess, like a dark moment of my life. And I think it's just because that's when it started everything. And so unfortunately, I find out after a couple of days that people, just because, you know, in aviation, especially in the, in the Air Force, after you fly solo, successfully done, you have to get in the pool of water and they're going to just throw in the pool. And that was the case for me. But unfortunately, there's not many people in the Air Force and among the male over in the Air Force that they did not like me to be there. They thought I'm an Muslim Afghan woman and me just being here is shameful and of course by the time that they are taking picture of and posting it on social media and just you know announcing it to the whole country that she is an Afghan she is not you know basically a pilot she is Americans are baptizing her she deserves to be killed dishonored she's bringing shame to our country Of course, most people don't believe what you try to tell them. They believe what you are trying, what they believe what they see. And that was the case for me. And unfortunately, I've been a bad symbol for the culture, for my extended family, for the society. And most people thought that I deserve to be killed just because what I have done and brought a shame for my country, for my religion, and for my family. And unfortunately, that great moment of every pilot turned out to be a very dark moment for me, just because 
lots of people, they just, even they knew they are wrong, but they just did not want to accept they're wrong. They just wanted to find a way to prove me wrong and actually wash me from everything that I have achieved. Yeah, I mean, the, in the United States, we, I just don't think that most people can really grasp that concept of there's plenty of garbage on social media. There's plenty of criticism about in social media. People will say things that are harmful or hurtful, but these were actual threats that your life, your family's lives were threatened. And can you just talk a a little bit? I mean, you talk about it in the book for, for anybody who hasn't read it and who is still listening and these are all spoilers, but you're going to want to read this book. Just talk about that experience about what your family was going through, how it was impacting you during your training. You know, every, I can say like every religion, every culture is great and it has a great things on it. And unfortunately, there is some extremist groups in Afghanistan that they abuse, even if it is a religion, by the name of religion, they abuse everything. They just want to show their power. And that's how they think they are in power and they can hurt someone like smaller than them or weaker or something that they feel they are strong, but that's not the case. I always believe if you're strong, go after a person stronger than yourself, then I can say that you're strong, but going after a woman in in the whole country that you know, you're wrong. She hasn't done anything. Even if you go in the YouTube, because social media works up huge, you know, it's huge in Afghanistan. Everybody believes or see or get their news over the social media. And unfortunately, they thought by shaming me by the name of religion that I am not a good person or a good brought a shame to, you know, Islam or my country. If they threaten me or my family, they will be honored by every people in the country. But I don't think that was smart. I don't think that would show them how strong or honorable they are. And I hope most people think exactly like I do. And it hurt me the moment that my dream and my action brought so much risk and difficulties and threat to my family's life. And someone that you love and you are ready to sacrifice everything for them, like they did for me, It was very heartbroken for me to see now my parents, my brother, my father, my sister life, everybody gets ruined just because a woman tried to raise her voice and and do something. And most importantly, be part of the society and fight for her right. And that's what they did to me and my family and which breaks my heart to even talking about it and even writing it and the book. It was very emotional for me and it was hard for me to even put it in a word and describe it. But all I can say is I will forgive them. And that way that made me stronger. And and if, if it wasn't because of that, I wouldn't be strong enough. I like you can see, I mean, it certainly impacted me emotionally very deeply. So I'm very sorry that you went through that. Thank you. Nobody's fault. Well, I guess just because it's somebody's fault, (laughs) it's not our fault, but it is somebody's fault for sure. Things got to a point where it was your father who finally drew the line for you and said you were in the United States training on the C-130 and he told you not to come back. And that wasn't, it, that was for everybody's safety, including especially your own, but the rest of the family too. Can you just talk about that decision for you to request political asylum in the United States and, and what it's meant to you since? Well, it definitely, I can say by the tone of his voice that even though like we've been through so much in Afghanistan, you know, starting with, my father been ashamed by his relative and my sister life got destroyed and she hasn't seen her son till nowadays. And a brother got shot and all those, you know, threats and horrible things happened to our life. My father, they never told me to quit, told me if you quit, they would think you couldn't handle it and you were not strong enough. And that's why you quit. They would never blame themselves for what they have done to us. And that made you to do this. 
I can imagine how hard it was for them while I was here and just be happy that I am doing actually a bigger and more achievement for my career, for my country, for the girls. And I was just so focused on my training and be happy that I am actually having this opportunity because not many other of mine had this opportunity to fly a bigger airplane and have this scholarship that I had and aware of what's happening back home, what my family is dealing with, which unfortunate part is that I always wished that if I get away from the situation and, you know, go away for a while and people do not see me every day in the Air Force, they would think I quit. And maybe this will make the life easier for the rest of my family. And I, we would, we, they might forget about it. But unfortunately, that was not the case. They would already thought I brought a shame for the entire family. And if they dishonor, I dishonor them. And if they honor kill anyone in my family, it doesn't matter. If they couldn't get me, they could go after each member of my family left in Afghanistan. And it would be pride for them. And I never could get to talk to them every day and see what's happening. And I was just so focused on my training and hearing that, that from my father that tells me what they've been through and who I am going back home to. It broke my heart because I wanted to celebrate that day with them. I wanted to go and actually do more missions for what I have learned. And I did not learn to fly the C-130s and go through that difficult training to just not fly it again. And it broke my heart. And because of the safety of myself and my family, I think that was the time for him which I can't imagine how hard it must have been for him to tell me it's time for me to quit. And to making that decision and staying away from them for a long time and not knowing when I will be able to see them, it was hard for me. Like I have been, for the first actually couple of years, it was very hard for me. Like I can't say it was more like a depression. It was kind of like being disappointed in myself that where all went, all my struggles, the risk and all those hard work that I have done. And maybe I led them to win. And there was a time that I had to get over it, that it has to happen at some point because we couldn't win this war just alone because I didn't have support of no one in that country. And of course, coming to the U.S., it wasn't easy, you know, Starting a life from zero for no one is easy, especially when you have done everything in your own country and worked hard for it in a certain age. age. And I had to do again, I had to start everything from zero, wait for immigration process, which has been taken forever. And but I'm thankful. I'm very thankful for the people that, uh, for the country that saved my life and gave me a new life. And that's why I want to do more for my life in the U.S. and for the people here, because they have saved my life and my family, not only me. And we have seen recently that how many people they have saved and they tried to help them for a better life. And just otherwise they would get killed. I'm sure as much as I am thankful, so many other people are thankful. It's difficult, but at least I'm not worried about what's going to come tomorrow after me or my family. And having a peaceful mind and a freedom, I mean, that means a lot to me and for my family as well. Do you feel safe? I absolutely do. Actually, at least I can tell like the feeling that I would... I would have back home that I would go to work and I would say goodbye to my parents, to my mom. She would be crying. She would be in tears. Like, am I coming back or not? At least that's not something I'm worried in the U S that I will be coming home or not. I know there's, you know, craziness everywhere. There's bad people everywhere, but I know I am safe here. At least I'm not waking up for some horrible things every morning. Well, you talked a little bit earlier about the withdrawal from Afghanistan and, and, you know, what you see is, is the outcome of that for the girls who are there. Do you have any words of encouragement for them? For sure. Like my heart, my soul is still there. And I would 
I just wish I could do more, at least with my voice. I hope I can, you know, be a voice for them. And all I can tell them to stay strong and this is not going to last forever. And I hope there is more women and girls in Afghanistan that they find in courage that they stand together and fight for themselves and for their rights and do not let those evils to win again and for what they worked hard for and they should never let them win they should just stay strong and raise their voice as much as they can. Adam, at the beginning, you kind of talked about how you read a little bit about her story, and that's what kind of hooked you. I'd love to hear how you experienced her story as you were writing it, and, and any other thoughts on sort of the, the context that we're in right now. Yeah, so I'd, I've spent in total over various over quite a few years, I, I've spent quite a few years actually in Afghanistan, working around the country, either in, in the South, Kabul, Northeast, and, and Northwest, and, and the West. So I got around quite a bit. But given a lot of the restrictions in Afghanistan, either from a societal or country aspect, you're only exposed to certain things. So when I had an opportunity to read about Nilofar's story in her, in her own words they, they came to me. And then we, as we had a, many discussions, and then over the year that it took us to write the book, I felt, uh, for me personally, very fortunate to get that kind of an insight into the personal experience of what, not only what it was like to be an Afghan, but a, but a female Afghan who achieved so much. And I felt really lucky because Nilofar is so self-aware you know, everybody has a story, but to be able to articulate, articulate that either verbally or in the written word isn't natural for everyone. So the fact that we could go back through nearly 30 years of life from what the story she heard from her father, him growing up and her experiences, and then to put that on paper was really unique and special for me. I, I've said it a few times already, but to me, this really was something special that I feel very glad that I was a part of. And I'm glad it's been received so well. You know, Adam, you're the first man I've interviewed for this project. <laughs> Which is funny, having been a woman in, a, in the military and working with men my whole career. I just, I, you know, it occurred to me as I was getting into this, I was like, oh, this is the first man that I'll have on the show. <laughs> I, I'm honored. I am honored. Congratulations. Well, I'm glad you're here. And I'm, I'm glad that, that, again, that both of you found each other and, and created this book for everybody to learn from, from her experiences and be inspired by Neela Farr, by your courage, your fortitude. How are you doing now? I saw that you want to fly, that you are flying. How are you doing in this moment with your aviation goals? And I also saw that you you have hopes to maybe fly for the U.S. military, and if that doesn't work out, what other options are you exploring in aviation? Well, I have been blessed again that you know in a country that I didn't have a right to do, and I have fought for it, and I would never regret even with everything happened in our life. But in the U.S., in a country that you have every freedom that you want. And you just need to use it in a right way. And you can absolutely be successful for it in a country that nobody tells me what is my limit and what am I supposed to do and what am I not supposed to do? I want to do more for my life. I want to be more successful in my life. So I have been blessed that I am back flying. I am working on my flight instructor license. I do want to pass the knowledge that I have to those that they have a passion for aviation and they want to be pilot and so their dreams. And I would be happy, you know, to share that and pass that to others. And doesn't matter if it is a female or a male, anybody that dreams. And I wish for all of them. And I hope I will be part of that to happen for each one of them and be able to help them. And for the future, I do want for sure, because it's all a matter of citizenship and my immigration situation, I do want to wear the uniform again and serve the country that saved my life and my family. And it's so important for me. And it will be my honor to do that. And I hope I will have that, that opportunity soon. 
And for my future goals, maybe it's crazy that I have already think about it and made it. So by the time that I am probably 40, 50s, I do want to be part of Congress and I want to be a good example of a refugee coming to the U.S., given the opportunities and rising in this country and, and be a voice now for that country, for that city. I mean, it means a lot for me and I would definitely work my best to make that happen. And I hope I will. Wow, Nilafar, that is wonderful and ambitious. And you instantly, you instantly reminded me of many, many of my peers at Harvard. And I just want to put this little star on your horizon for when it's the right time for you. If, if those are your ambitions, I hope that you will consider pursuing a master in public administration from Harvard's Kennedy School of Government because. I feel like that is a place where you would be very, very welcome, and they would be eager to have you there as a student. Thank you. I appreciate that. And it would give you, it would give you the sort of the global perspective, I think, that you might want to pursue those goals. So thank you. But in the meantime, good luck with your flying goals, your immediate goal of, of earning your CFI. Am I correct in, that you are in the Tampa area, Tampa, Florida? And yes, at the moment. Okay. Well, I am just a couple of hours away from you. So I would love it Wonderful. if I could, I'm, I'm over in Fort Lauderdale, so I could drive across Alligator Alley and, and hopefully meet up with you sometime. Absolutely. We'd love to. Adam Sykes and Nilufar Rahmani, thank you so much for this interview. And we're going to get into talking more specifically about the craft of writing and putting this book together. But before we did, I just wanted to say thank you so much for your time and, and thank you for this book and for all of your effort to, to share your story with us. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you for listening and thank you coming home well for your collaboration in helping these stories reach a broader audience. Writing is a deeply healing and cathartic exercise. It can help you process your experiences, whether you intend to share them with the world or keep them to yourself. Living the experiences of others through reading can also help heal, validate, and create a sense of connectedness. If you're interested in hearing about how these authors brought their stories to life on the page, check out the Writer's Room interviews on the Aviatrix book review website and podcast. If you'd like to join the book club conversations, look for the Aviatrix Book Club on Facebook. All are welcome. And connect with me on social media at Literary Aviatrix. I'd love to hear from you. Blue skies and happy reading. Happy reading.